Well, I think we are at the 350 mark, 350. So uh, oh. maybe I'll give it a minute or two, given the okay. fact that we had a little bit of a delay here. Right. And let, uh, let folks trickle in. Well, and and um, uh, of course, it's being, it's being recorded. So they will put this out. So even though you start and there might not be very many, they'll put, put it out later. So you can go ahead and start when you think you're ready. And, Record. Okay, copy that. We'll get started. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Happy February 19th, 2021. My name is Lieutenant Bryant. Uh, I'm with the Civil Air Patrol here in the New Mexico wing. Um, and uh, happy to be here with you today to uh, entertain some aerospace education discussion at this uh, Nuclear Museum Discover STEAM event. Uh, we're going to talk about parachutes today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Civil Air Patrol. And then we're going to try to talk uh, and connect the uh, parachute activity with some recent aerospace events, groundbreaking events, uh, where we um, uh, recently landed a, a very large rover and a helicopter uh, on Mars. And we'll tie this parachute discussion to that activity. So let's see. Uh, moving on to the next chart, uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, if I'm honest, I uh, was was drawn to it primarily uh, in service to my younger daughter, who's not quite at the age to, uh, that she's able to join as a cadet just yet, but was very interested in the notion of Civil Air Patrol. And uh, uh, as a uh, assistance to her, I thought, well, let me let me join and uh, do some pathfinding for you. And what I found uh, in my in my uh, tenure here thus far is that it's actually very rewarding and fulfilling for me. Uh, as well. I am an aerospace education officer with the New Mexico wing, the external aerospace education officer, and then I'm also part of New Mexico 83, which is Spirit Squadron. I'm an uh, assistant aerospace education officer, or AEO, and an assistant communications officer in that squadron. Uh, so really excited. Uh, we'll touch a little bit on what CAP is here. Um, Civil Air Patrol, um, I've got a fantastic video I'd like to show. Uh, it's actually in it's actually in uh, our our linked material. Um, I tell you what, I'm having having difficulty here getting that open. I thought I had that at the ready, uh, but it looks like that may have uh, may have disappeared. So you know, I'm going to skip over that. I'll point you to our booth material. Uh, it's got a really nice promotional video from. Our 75th anniversary, it's about two to three minutes long, uh, really covers some of the highlights of uh, what we do as an organization. And I'll give you some of that here on the slide. Um, we're, we're the Air Force Civilian Auxiliary. We're a nonprofit 501c3 corporation. Uh, we're all over the country in every state. Uh, we've got about 60,000 members, just, just shy of 60,000 uh, and uh, just under 2,000 units in the nation. Uh, the largest fleet of single engine piston aircraft in the world. And we're head headquartered at uh, Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. We've got three primary missions, Cadet Program, Aerospace Education, and Emergency Services. Again, uh, this, this staff that's with you today, and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dewing, myself, and uh, Captain Marie, who you, who you may have seen yesterday, uh, are in the aerospace education uh, mission space primarily, but we, we also touch the other mission spaces. I also spend uh, plenty of time volunteering for emergency services, in particular lately here with COVID missions, so lots of neat things to get into. There's some detail here on the cadet program. Really, the focus there is to develop the potential of youth age 12 to 21, and, and there's a great program uh, for them here in Civil Air Patrol. Aerospace education, we are chartered by the U.S. Congress and the uh, U.S. Air Force uh, to make sure that we're educating our members and the general public on the important role aviation, space, cyberspace, and science, technology, engineering, and math play and will continue to play in our nation's future. Uh, and so how do we do that? We do that through internal aerospace education, primarily focused on our members and cadets. Uh, and then we have an external aerospace education uh, program, which I am uh, um, point on for the wing. And that's really aimed at educators, institutions, and the general public. Um, and uh, the third mission area is emergency services. Just a quick taste of what we do in emergency services. Uh, you know, the training that we offer our members and cadets in ES is... Uh, is, is really, really impressive. Uh, our members participate in search and, search and rescue, supporting homeland security, disaster, disaster relief, humanitarian assistance, and a number of other uh, 
uh, emergency services activity, in particular Air Force support. So we do uh, on the order of 90% uh, of the Air Force uh, uh, domestic search and rescue uh, support activities. So really, really cool organization. That, I'm going to stop it there on the CAP overview, but uh, there's there's lots of different ways to get involved. You can uh, be involved if you're under 21 as a cadet, and then you can be a senior member. That includes aerospace education member membership and uh, being a cadet sponsor if that's a path you want to take. If you'd like for more information, you can contact me and we'll get you in touch uh, with folks that can help you uh, develop your path uh, to membership. So let's dive into the activity parachutes. So what is a parachute? Well, uh, quite simply, it's a device used to slow the motion of an object through atmosphere. That can be any kind of atmosphere makeup. Uh, here on Earth, obviously, it's, uh, it's air. Uh, and, and, and we do that through um, uh, air resistance, uh, also known as drag. Uh, you know, there's other specialty parachutes that exist. Uh, we have ram air parachutes. You also have, probably have seen uh, maybe at the beginning of big sports events, uh, some of our service members will come uh, in. Uh, parachuting in and land on the field in a football game, for instance. Those are special uh, uh, airfoil type parachutes that are uh, designed for control and uh, putting putting uh, the package down in a very specific location. Usually made out, parachutes in general are usually made out of light, strong fabric. Uh, originally, they were made out of silk. Now they're most commonly nylon. nylon. Um, uh, you see a lot of parachutes, as you see in this image here, are dome shaped. Uh, but, you know, you can have different sizes. You may see rectangles, inverted domes, and uh, there are others out there. A little bit of history. Um, back in the uh, late 1400s, Leonardo da Vinci uh, is who we can attribute the earliest written record of uh, regarding the idea of a parachute. And you'll see some indication of that here in this notation uh, uh, of what was referred to as his tent roof design. Uh, and then moving on to the 1600s, uh, in the early 1600s, we had a, uh, a Venetian uh, that developed another uh, parachute concept. That'll be here. This will be this, uh, what we refer to as the flying man uh, concept. And then progressing towards the late 1700s, or early 1800s, we start to see balloonists in France experiment with parachutes. So uh, if you're up on your history, you'll know that uh, the French were putting people up in uh, uh, what, what amount to hot air balloons. And uh, those balloon pilots were thinking, why, well, hey, if this thing fails on me, how am I getting to the ground safely? And uh, one of the concepts that came up with uh, were, were parachutes. In the early 1900s here, we have Georgia Tiny Broadwick, who was, uh, who was attributed uh, with the first parachuting free fall and release uh, of her own parachute. So that's an image of her there with that on her back. And then, of course, you progress into the uh, early to mid 1900s, in particular World War II, we see uh, incredible utility of the parachute in uh, Operation Mar Market Garden. That's a little bit of history on the parachute. Just some real quick basics on the parachute. As I mentioned, they work by principle of air resistance, also known as drag. And what is this? So this is fundamentally uh, as, as the large surface area of the parachute uh, descends with some mass at the apex of the, of, the, uh, of the lines of the parachute, either it be a person or a package, uh, gravity is going to want to pull that package to the ground while the air, air resistance uh, from the parachute is going to slow that descent through air uh, basically pushing on the surface area of the parachute material. Here you can see some, uh, some traditional, pretty typical components of the parachute. Uh, you know, you'll have, you'll have different connection uh, features either at the chute with the lines or down near the harness where, where the, uh, the person or the package is connected. Some parachutes will have uh, sh smaller chutes that come out that help pull the parachute uh, out of a pack, for instance, if it's in there. Sometimes you'll see uh, what we refer to as drogue shoots, uh, but lots of different, different makeup and, and combination of makeup uh, for parachutes. All right, so uh, I'll pause there, and I guess I can take a peek uh, at the chat. I think I can see the chat. Uh, let's see here. Yes. Uh, so it doesn't look like there's any questions coming in. If you do have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat, and I'll do my best to monitor that and uh, try to provide an answer uh, 
uh, as we're progressing. So we'll get into the activity now. Uh, materials uh, that we were we were hoping uh, folks might collect in advance for this activity are scissors. So grab yourself a pair of scissors. Any any pair of scissors will do. I've got a nice uh, pair of uh, what appear to be uh, poultry shears, perhaps, but uh, they they work <laughs> just as well. Uh, you're going to need a plastic bag. So what I found is that a plastic bag from the grocery store uh, works really well. Um, so you'll get yourself a plastic bag. I've got mine here from from uh, the grocery store just up the road. Uh, you're going to need uh, a toothpick. A toothpick. So a toothpick. We're going to use this to help create um, an attachment point for for the strings or the cords in our parachute. Uh, and then you'll need some sort of a weighted object. I prefer a paper clip, uh, which you'll find, and, and you can experiment on your own, but I've got a paper clip here. That's a nice, nice mass, nice weight for this, for this design of parachute. If you go any heavier than that, uh, you might have to make your parachute quite a bit bigger, um, but paper clips should be good. And then, uh, you know, if you want to be exact on the me measurements, you're welcome to get yourself a, uh, a, a ruler. Oh, and I skipped over the most important part. Probably you're going to need some kind of string. So it could be yarn. It could be any any string that's about this weight, about that length. It could be. I suppose you could even use dental floss if you don't have any string around. Just something that's going to uh, create the, the cordage for your parachute. All right. So what we're going to do first is you'll take your plastic bag. And you're going to want to cut a rectangle roughly 10 inches by 8 inches, and so. Um, you know, if I, if I hold it apart, it's about the size, maybe just a little bigger than my head in one direction, and then add a couple inches in the other, you'll have a nice rectangle. Get yourself a square cut out. Um, I've already gone ahead and done that ahead of time. And so that's what my, uh, that's what mine ended up looking like. Okay, and so just, just quite a uh, few inches larger than my hand is what I ended up with, but you're welcome to make it as uh, large or small as you like. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take your toothpick and you're gonna want to find each corner of the bag and about an inch or so from the edge in either direction, uh, in and sideways, you're gonna wanna put a hole with the toothpick is uh, you'll see you'll see the size of the hole I ended up with. What I had to do, I know it's probably difficult to see. What I had to do was uh, take my toothpick and kind of kind of stretch it a little bit because my toothpick diameter was smaller than my yarn diameter, so I had to make it big enough to get it through there. And you go go ahead and do that in all four corners. You'll see here. Uh, I've had one that's uh, come out of the hole, so I'll get that back in there. I'd make it if you like. Uh, but you'll go ahead and make the holes and then once you got the holes you're going to take uh, your string and cut it into four equal lengths 10 inch length is good for your string and i'll let you work on that a little bit while i'm getting my string pulled back through my hole here after you got your your lengths cut You'll go ahead and write word. You'll just want to thread those through those strings through the hole that you cut there in each corner. Okay. And then what you want to do is you want to tie a knot at the end of that string. And that's going to provide a way to help secure your string uh, inside that hole so that when it's when it's working, it doesn't come out. All right. And so I'll show you what that looks like here. That's my knot at the end of my string. And you can see it the other side here. That's my string passing through and then once you've got that done you'll have on the inside of the parachute you'll then want to take your strings and collect them into a bunch down at the bottom okay so just bunch them up with your hand like that and uh i probably passed over this in the materials but you were uh, it's it's listed there. I don't think I said it, but you want to grab yourself some tape. It doesn't have to be in a fancy dispenser like this. Masking tape, any kind of tape, really will work. But you want to have, go ahead, go ahead and get yourself a little piece and peel that off. Okay, about that size would be fine. You take your paper clip and you go ahead and put that up against the bunched end 
of your strings. So collect all the strings up against the back of your paper clip. You go ahead and take your, your tape and you'll wrap it around your paper clip. Okay. And when you're done, we're not finished there because what you want to do as the final step is you're going to want to take your scissors and you go ahead and just fold the top of your parachute like so and take your scissors and just cut a small one inch cut in the top of your parachute. That's going to be sort of a vent on your parachute. You can see my finger passing through there. That's going to be a vent on your parachute that allows some of the air to escape as your mass is, is falling back to earth. And why is that important? Well, we, we say it there. Um, it, it's really about control. And so if you think about the air resistance that you're creating with your parachute, the drag, it, it, the, the air wants to escape the surface of this off to the edges of your parachute. And so if you don't put the hole there, you may find that when you throw your parachute in the air, if you put a little hole in the top and you have a little bit of air to pass through the center, it helps to establish control of the, of the parachute. And so, I'll give you a little bit of time to, to finish that up. And uh, we may have a cameo appearance here by a uh, young uh, member. Um, I, I had signed to support us uh, in demonstrating the parachute, but uh, I think uh, he may be a little off schedule here. So if he doesn't show up here in a moment, we'll demonstrate uh, without it. But uh, go ahead and uh, proceed. And I'll pause again here for a moment and take a peek at the chat. <laughs> If there are any questions being dropped in, uh, and uh, I'll encourage uh, folks if there are questions, uh, you have you have some questions, go ahead and drop them in into the chat, and uh, maybe uh, forward a link on for some others to to enjoy this. If you haven't downloaded this activity slide, uh, I've got a reference at the top of the page there. Uh, that's very similar in the procedure that we just went through. Uh, that's the instructables.com slash make a fun parachute toy. So, and, uh, and demonstrate mine. So I'm ready. Minimize the chat so that I can see what you're seeing in the camera. And so hopefully as I toss this up, you'll see it pass by the camera and slowly descend to the ground. Yeah, and I'm not sure if you caught it, caught it in the video. We'll try one more time. And there we go. All right. So the neat thing about these parachutes that we made is fundamentally they're still operating on similar principles that we're about to make a connection with in terms of the Mars mission. So continue. If you haven't finished your, your activity here, don't worry. We'll give you some time. I'm going to go ahead and proceed and then draw some connections here some more relevant events uh, that we recently have seen as a nation in aerospace. All right, maybe aware. Uh, yesterday, we had a very significant uh, exploration milestone in that uh, our nation and NASA put another rover on Mars. And so uh, if, you were, if you were watching uh, the descent phase of the first Severance mission. Uh, you likely saw somewhere in there that there was a, par a parachute that could actually effectively work uh, for this mission. And there's two primary uh, challenges that, that had to be overcome by the design teams in order to get us to a point where we had a, an acceptable parachute. One, uh, yeah. The payload's moving very quickly uh, on its way to Mars so that it can get there uh, in a reasonable amount of time down somewhat as it's, uh, as it's entering Mars's atmosphere parachute before you get to the point of running the sky crane. And uh, so, so the parachute's going to open um, at uh, supersonic uh, conditions. 
And so how, how do you design a parachute that will survive the loads created when, you, when it's first deployed? That's one design challenge. The other challenge was atmosphere here on Earth, uh, except that maybe uh, here on Earth at 23 miles up, where this parachute on Mars ends up deploying, uh, the, the atmospheric composition in terms of how thick or thin it is at the point of deployment on Mars is, is, is somewhat similar. So we were able to create um, relatively uh, similar conditions, but not exactly the same. And so uh, what I'll do here, uh, it looks like I lost my, looks like I lost my video. So stand by, I'll go ahead and open for uh, advanced supersonic parachute inflation research experiment uh, that went on um, leading up to our acceptance and readiness to use this parachute. And uh, so you forgive me here, but I've got to go back and search because I inadvertently closed it. But I'll come out here momentarily. Uh, while I'm saying I'm off and on and breaking up, sorry about that. Hopefully it's better now. All right. And I'll need confirmation. Perhaps uh, the, the other moderators here can uh, assure me that once I play the video that the sound is coming through. I believe I set that up properly. So let's see here. <clears throat> Get this going. at nearly twice the speed of sound. Attached is a 3,000 pound payload that is designed to test a parachute for Mars. On board, a computer is calculating the altitude and speed to determine the precise time that it will signal to deploy the parachute. These are the first tests of parachutes for Mars. 50 years ago, NASA began lofting parachutes to altitudes and speeds meant to simulate the conditions of Mars entry. Those early tests demonstrated the challenges of inflating lightweight materials in a 1500 mile an hour wind and having them survive well enough to help enable a safe landing on the red planet. Today, as our missions become ever more daring, we need new parachutes capable of surviving those strenuous environments, and we need ways of testing them at loads higher than ever before. To make those tests a reality, engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory worked with NASA's Wallops Flight Facility to develop a new test technique. The Advanced Supersonic Parachute Inflation Research Experiments, or ASPIRE project, uses a two-stage Black Brant 9 sounding rocket to carry its payload to the conditions needed to stress the parachute. The rocket is launched out over the Atlantic Ocean and ascends to altitudes where the atmosphere of Earth mimics the atmosphere near the surface of Mars. The third and final ASPIRE test launched on September 7th. The parachute was deployed at nearly twice the speed of sound. In less than half a second, 200 pounds of nylon, Kevlar, and Technora go from a small drum-sized bag with a density of wood to an inflated parachute with the volume of a large house, generating nearly 70,000 pounds of drag. Here, in slow motion images, you can see the rapid emergence of the parachute as it begins generating the drag crucial for deceleration at Mars. These images give us amazing insights into the physics and early behaviors of a supersonic parachute inflation. The apparent ease of the unfurling and unfolding in the parachute belies the severity of the extreme environment in which this occurs. Waiting below were a recovery team who had retrieved both the parachute and the payload and returned them to shore. The parachute was then buffering, mostly rinsed and hung to dry before inspection. Miles and miles of thread and over 3 million stitches are used to hold the parachute together. 
and we will examine each stitch. After three successful tests of Aspire, NASA has now tested their new exceeding any large supersonic parachute before it, and 40% higher than the highest load expected for the most 2020 mission. Our parachute is now certified. All right. Well, uh, quite a bit of engineering involved that may uh, seem simple based on our activity, but uh, significant challenges that the design teams had to overcome in order to get us to the point of having a uh, parachute ready to support yesterday. Uh, so really, really impressive with the engineers and uh, folks involved at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory there uh, in, in here. Um, we have a comment, uh, I believe it was from uh, Patricia. Uh, watched the NASA team talk through Mars landing yesterday, so exciting. And you could tell a great relief to them when they knew the shoot opened. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I was... Uh, I was watching along as well, and uh, I'm sure my family got hooting and hollering and cheering, uh, much less like what you saw uh, the mission teams doing there uh, at JPL. So uh, I think it was a proud moment for not only us as a nation, but absolutely those that have been working so hard for so long to get us to, to that point. All right, so uh, I believe that is all I have to cover today. Uh, I'm happy to go into a Q&A mode, take, take questions from folks. Uh, if there are any, please others uh, are able to come on with audio. Um, so maybe the best way to do this is if you have questions or comments, drop them into the chat. And we'll give a, give a few moments there for that. And it could be either on the parachutes or the, the topic. Uh, it could be about Civil Air Patrol. I did that. A little bit up front. I didn't get a chance to show our promotional video, but it should be in our in our uh, virtual booth. Uh, there's a link there to take a look at that. All right, so we do have a question here coming in from Hunter. Uh, the question is, when did they start working on that parachute? Well, um, I would say it would it would have to have been at least a handful of years, if not more. Uh, particularly for the one used on uh, on this mission before the videos I just showed you. And so those videos indicated that uh, those tests that were shown uh, were back in the top. Uh, and then I'm, I'm sure uh, probably, um, you know, that specific parachute uh, design activity probably started some handful of years before that. Uh, would not be surprising if this cycle uh, the life cycle for that design and, and fielding activity was uh, was decadal. Now, what I can tell you is that uh, the principles by which the teams built their knowledge off of uh, go back many, many decades. So, so, so back into the you know mid-century time frame uh, when we were looking at bringing folks back from uh, uh, from our manned missions, early manned missions. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, and even before that, um, the idea of trying to figure out how to slow down uh, this mass that's coming back uh, to Earth at the time uh, built the foundation for the knowledge that the teams continued to build on when they when they designed this supersonic uh, parachute for for Mars. Yeah, there's another comment coming through regarding our CAP uh, promotional video. Promo video is available in the CAP exhibitor booth. Check it out. Yep, absolutely agree. Uh, yeah, so so glad. Uh, hopefully that answered your question, Hunter. What other questions do we have from participants? Let me give it some time here. Um, while we're waiting to see if others uh, have questions, um, you know, I, I do want to extend appreciation to the team here that uh, helped work through the technical issues for this particular presentation. I know that we didn't start uh, initially as advertised, but uh, we were able to get through those challenges. And I'm glad to see that we were able to get into uh, the content and the topic today. And a special thank, thanks again to the organizers uh, for allowing uh, us here at the Civil Air Patrol to be a part of it. Uh, it's a great event. And uh, just really, really glad to be a part of it. 